Saturday. I heard I hope that the Lord has met you and that you have just done great exploits, very many things, accomplished goals, um, and just spent time in the Lord's presence. Amen. I pray that y'all are able to take time to just seek the Lord and, and just rest in His presence. I think sometimes we always feel like we need to be speaking, right? And sometimes we just need to sit at the feet of Jesus. Don't say nothing. Just sit at his feet and allow him to speak to us. So um, we just come out of the feast. Actually, we're coming out of the Feast of Tabernacles today. Um, and so, you know, this is a very, very um, special day because this is a day where, you know, the Lord is beckoning us to come and drink, right? To come and drink and be filled, right? Those that hunger and thirst for righteousness shall be filled. Come and drink of this living water. Like he told the woman at the well, come and drink of this living water. Amen. So I pray that you guys are just staying full on the word, full on, you know, uh, whatever the Lord is ministering to your heart. So that's what it's all about. We can listen to podcasts, we can listen to sermons, we can go to church, we can go to Bible study. But at the end of the day, we should have a personal relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We should spend time in the Word for ourselves. We should spend time with the Lord, not asking for anything, but just in His presence. Amen. And so, I don't even know that. <laughs> I don't even know. I guess that's just something that uh, the Lord wanted to say. And I know that I need to apply that to myself. Honestly, um, because I think I do more talking than I do listening. And so then I'm wondering why I'm not hearing from the Lord. Amen. And so if you're having that same problem when you feel like, you know, you've gone to the Lord, you've brought your concerns to the Lord like the Word tells us to do, but you're not hearing from Him, maybe it's because we're not giving Him an opportunity to speak. You know, sometimes we have a um, tendency to pray because we're moving fast all the time in our life. You know, you may have a lot going on, you may be working, you may have a family, you know, you may have some obligations. And so there may be some things that you have to do. So, you know, it's, it's easier to let go and pray and then kind of just get up and go on about our day. But God doesn't work like that, right? He, he doesn't, you know, he's not on our time schedule. And so a lot of the times he might be ready to give you an answer, but you have, now we started our day. We've gotten busy. Now our mind is distracted. Now we're thinking of all these hundred billion things that are going on in our day, right? And so um, it, it's not all lost. If that has been your pattern, it's, it's nothing like today's the day. You can change that by just simply carving out time that is intentional, right? Even if it's like you have to get up a little earlier. So you can have that time to just be still in the presence of God. <clears throat> And again, I'm talking to myself, guys, so don't think I'm just on here trying to tell you guys or trying to, you know, accuse you guys of anything. It's not that. It's that sometimes we're, we're more it's others that's in the same place, right? A lot of times we can feel like it's just us, but you'll find that when you begin to speak out that other people are, you know, going through the same thing or struggling with the same thing. So it's encouraging for you to know, like, it's not just you. So I just said that as, my, as a testimony, really, to say that if that is you, it's not just you. And like, I, and like the Lord, you know, he's always, he's always there ready for us to come to him. And so we just have to do our part. Amen. And so we're going to, we're about to get into it guys. So I'm going to let the countdown roll, uh, roll and then we're going to get into it. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So again, welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to all my new listeners. I thank you guys so much. I see you. Um, I see you. I see the new streams, the new downloads um, on some of the platforms. I, I don't have access to all of them, but I do see that more people are listening, especially on YouTube. Shout out to my YouTube family. Thank you guys for the support. Um, I appreciate you guys so much. And just whatever platform you're listening on, I just appreciate you and just know you're worthy and you're even you even are valuable. You add value to this podcast. You add value to me by just supporting the podcast. And so you can continue to support the podcast by um, like, commenting, and sharing. If you are listening on a platform where you're able to comment and share and like, please do so. If you're able to leave a review, please do so. That helps the podcast get more visibility. That helps the podcast be able to, you know, um, get boosted up and um, be, get in front of more people. So I just appreciate you guys. And I just would um, 
just ask that you guys would just simply like, comment, share, share with your community, share with people you know, right? If there's if there's something that you hear that someone else needs to hear, just send it to them. It's just that simple. That's all you guys have to do to help me to su help support this platform is to just simply share, like, or comment, or leave a review. And so thank you guys so much. Also, thank you to my loyal listeners, you guys. I just appreciate you guys so much. Let me just, you know, just give it up to you guys for a minute. You know, because it is, again, if I couldn't do it without you guys, I'm telling you, it's not easy. It's not easy getting up and doing a podcast. It sounds easy. It sounds good. We know we're in a time where a lot of people are doing podcasts. A lot of people are doing podcasts for this on vid audio podcast, a video podcast. A lot of people are, you know, having these different platforms where they're using at, and, they're, and, and they have a voice, right? And so it can look easy. It can sound easy, but it's not. And so just to have support, you know, it doesn't matter the how small it is. All of it matters. And for people who have been listening to the podcast for, you know, a few seasons, we are in season five right now. We'll be in season five, probably the end of October. So the end of this month, we'll end season five. I'm going to probably just kind of go on a break um, like I do, do normally, but I'll probably go on an extended break this time and, and start season six in January just to start fresh with the new year because I have some new ideas and things that I want to do with the podcast that it's going to take some time to really get that um you know, to, to to iron that out and to be able to build that and get that into the to the place of excellence, I would like it. So as we launch for the new year, that you know we come with that fire, right? <laughs> so I just again appreciate everybody. Everybody deserve everybody the real V the real MVP on this podcast. Nobody is big or small. We're all in this thing together. All the support matters. Whether you just listen listening for the first time or you've been listening for a long time, you matter. And I just thank you guys so 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 much. So welcome to the Purity After Promiscuity podcast. I'm your host, Janelle Renee. And on this podcast, we are redefining a woman's worth. Amen. And sometimes I do get my brothers on here. So don't worry, bros, that you guys are welcome. Y'all my brothers. You are brothers in Christ. If the Lord is speaking to you through this podcast, by all means, please listen and share even with your community because it's not gender specific. It's just that my mandate is to my sisters in Christ. Like that's what the Lord, who the Lord called me to, but that doesn't mean that he won't speak through me to you as a man. So, um, I do appreciate the support from my brothers. I think that's super dope. Like, I think it's super dope that you guys would even listen to a podcast called purity after promiscuity, but we can't even make it you know, a gender specific thing because it's not just a woman thing. It's it's anybody. Men and women both struggle with sexual sin or struggle with promiscuity or struggle with having some type of sexual abuse or something happen in their life or in their past that led them to, to go down a certain path, right? We're all looking to, you know, level up, right? I don't know who wants to remain the same. I know I don't like so we're all looking to level up. We're all looking to redefine our worth. And so we're in this thing together and and so I do just welcome you guys um you men to you know again if the lord is blessing you through this podcast then please continue to listen and so today's episode is called the quiet storm and i'm going to say y'all i was like a little apprehensive when i first heard the lord say something about a storm to me and it was funny because in the midst of me doing bible study with my children and what we were, what I was teaching them about yesterday had nothing to do with a storm. But when we are in allowing ourselves to be led by Holy Spirit, it's like sometimes he'll just lead you kind of on this, like this, this, this scavenger hunt where you might start one place in the word of God. And next thing you know, you're over here and you're over there, but then it all makes sense. Right. And so that's kind of what happened yesterday when we were in our um, personal Bible study time as a family. And I started teaching them because um, I normally would like to challenge my sons to make them be involved, to ask them, what do they want to learn about? Who do they want to hear about? Who, you know, as much as they know about the word of God, right? I try to pull that out of them to get them thinking, like, what do they want to know about? And so they were kind of, you know, saying different things, quoting different things, saying different names, you know, talking about different Bible stories. And then we kind of settled on uh, my son was like, I want to learn about the disciples. I think he said the apostles first. And so I was like, oh, you want to learn about that? He was like, I want to learn about Peter. So I was like, oh, okay, that's dope. You want to learn about Peter? So let's go. So I was like, well, let me look in the word of God and just kind of see where the Lord will lead me. And the Lord led me to Matthew 4. And in Matthew 4, that's 
Jesus coming right out of his temptation, right, experience, right out of being in that wilderness for those 40 days where the spirit led him into that wilderness to be tempted. And really, he was on a fast. He was really preparing himself for ministry. And see, that's, um, you know, something that we should do. Even if we know we're called to ministry, we should definitely take time to sit in the Lord's face in the presence of God, whether it's prayer and fasting or consecration or whatever that looks like, to prepare us for ministry. Because a lot of times I think our mindset that when it comes to ministry, we think that everything is just going to just go well because God called me. And that's not always the case. It's normally not the case. Actually, it's normally the opposite because God called you. I'll just be honest. So we're reading that and we're seeing how Jesus, when as he's walking, he comes up upon, you know, um, Simon, um, known as Peter and his brother Andrew. And they're fishermen and they're in the boat. And he walks by and he tells them, follow me. And I think it's so interesting that it's the Bible says, and immediately they followed him. Like, and it said, and he told them, I, I'm going to make you fishers of people or fishers of men. And it's so interesting to me, like how they're doing what they have normally done. They are in their career. They are, you know, doing what they need to do to provide for their families. Because we got to remember the apostles, a lot of, a few of them had families and wives, like they were married, you know, they had careers, you know, they were, you know, doing what they needed to do as the men in their culture and their time to provide to, to, you know, to be able to, you know, be productive citizens of society to be able to make sure that they have a, you know, able to have a, a livelihood. And so in the midst of them working in their business, right? Them being fishermen, that was their business, right? So that's like equivalent to you having your own business and the Lord just come tap you on the shoulder like, leave this, come follow me. And so they did. And it says immediately. And I thought that was like, wow, like they didn't question it. It don't say they had to pray about it. It don't say that they asked a bunch of questions. It says immediately. And so, you know, the Bible doesn't give us a lot of description or a lot of details about if they had some awareness of who Jesus was, if they knew him, what would, what would cause them to just leave everything, right? To leave their entire business in that moment. He didn't say, I'm going to come back tomorrow and come get you. And, and that way you can spend some time with your family and give everybody a kiss and come on. He said, follow me. And they immediately did it. Like what was in them? What gave them the indication that this was the call? Amen. And so then the next few scriptures talks about him coming upon um, James and John, the, the, the sons of Zebedee, right? And they also were fishermen and they were in the boat with their father Zebedee. Now, here you go. The first brothers were just together in the boat, a pair. The second brothers were in the boat, but with their father, which again lets us know this was a family business. So it wasn't just them fishing, you know, and and, and, and providing and, you know, doing this as a, as a form of, you know, their livelihood. This was a family business. They're in the boat with their, with their father. So they probably were still young as well. And he told them, follow me. And they left their father and the boat and they followed him. And then, you know, it just kind of goes on to, you know, um, the rest of that story. But, you know, that was the call. And I thought it was just so interesting, just in the way that God so casually will beckon in us. Like, and I, and I can speak to that because he's done that to me. And like I was explaining to my sons, everybody's not going to be called to leave like their, their business or leave their family or, you know, leave their vocation or, you know, their career, right? Everybody's not going to be asked to leave their location, right? To, to, to relocate and go somewhere else, but some will be. And that's, that's, that's the nature of the journey, right? That's the nature of the journey. And it's interesting that these men were called and they were called by Jesus personally because at this time Jesus is he's God in the flesh he's dwelling among us he's walking among the earth he personally called him, them so they had a tangible experience unlike us now when we were since when we sense a call when we know that the Lord is calling us he's beckoning us right it may start with a thought all of a sudden a thought may come in, into your mind out of nowhere you're like why where did that thought come from why did I think that and then it may come to something in your in your spirit right there's something all of a sudden in your spirit spirit starts to shift right you know maybe you start being dissatisfied with where you are maybe your mind you start thinking like what if there's more maybe you start feeling like i think you know it's my time doing this is about to come to an end like there are things it just kind of starts right the lord plants the seed and then it just kind of starts to produce fruit right 
But again, Jesus has is not personally coming to us in the flesh anymore, right? We believe because we believe by faith. Like, we're not like Doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas, he needed to stick, stick his fingers in the holes of Jesus to believe that this was truly Jesus who had rose from the grave, right? He said, you believe because you see. But again, these, we got to remember the disciples were human and they saw Jesus in the flesh and they believed, right? And so then... He said, blessed are those who believe but do not see. So we don't see Jesus in the flesh. We see him because we experience the, the presence of God and Holy Spirit within us. But we're not seeing him visually, right? But they did. And not only did they see him and they know for a fact that he called them. There was no confusion there. Because sometimes because we are humans and we are in this body and we have a soul, sometimes we're we might get confused on what voice is this. Sometimes we think, is this my voice? Is this the voice of another? Is this God? And so sometimes we can be a little confused because we're not sure, because we're not going off of something tangible. We're going off something spiritual. It's internal. So sometimes the, the knowing can bring a quiet storm. Come on, somebody. It's going to make sense in a minute. And so they know for a fact they were called. They know who called them. They they know Jesus called them. They left everything they knew, right? But then later on in their journey, they find themselves themselves in a storm. And how they respond in this storm is so interesting. And the Lord really began to minister to me. And so he took me um, to Mark 4. And um, it's titled, Jesus Rebukes the Wind. And I'm reading out of the New King James Version. And the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind and the waves beat unto the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now, I find it interesting that now these men, these disciples who are in this boat have by now seen him perform miracles. They see him feed a multitude. They see him heal people. They see him, you know, open blind eyes. They've seen the paralytics get up and walk. They've seen demons be cast out. Like they see. And again, the Bible isn't exhaust, uh, uh, exhaustive in it. That is sharing with us every single miracle that Jesus performed. I'm sure there are miracles that are not recorded that he performed, but again, they're walking with him day in and day out. They are walking with him personally. They are seeing him in the flesh. They are seeing these miracles, these great exploits. They're seeing the power of God right in the midst of them. And yet and still, when they get into the storm, there's fear. How many times do we know God called us to something? How many times do we know that God called us to, you know, to a place or to do a thing or to build something or to start a ministry or to start a business or to, you know, get into this marriage or whatever it is, right? How many times do we, we, we're confident, right? We know that we know we hear the voice of God, but there's something about a storm that rages. That when we in that storm, all of a sudden we forget who is with us. And I find it interesting that even in the midst of that storm, Jesus was there. It's not like Jesus was not in the boat with them. They have God right in the boat with them. And he's asleep because that is how God wants us to be in the midst of the storm. But is that logical? No. And what happens when the storm is quiet, though? See, that was an outward storm, so it was raging and it was physical. Sometimes our storm is physical. Sometimes everything around us is falling apart. Sometimes, you know, 
think we're losing things, we're losing relationships, we're losing people, we're experiencing loss of loved ones. Sometimes we're experiencing some kind of loss of, you know, relationship, friendship. Sometimes we're experiencing some, you know, things being shaken up within our finances. Sometimes we're experiencing, you know, having to, you know, make decisions that, you know, we never foresaw us having to make or things beginning to fall apart or we're having trouble within our in our um, relationship. Sometimes, you know, we're, we're, we're experiencing some turbulence of some sort and it's on the it's physical and it creates a storm and the waves begin to rage and the wind is blowing and you feel like that you're this ship and that if something don't happen that you're going to be shipwrecked and it's even then that God is with us, especially if we know that he sent you. But again, we I think it's the idea of us believing subconsciously because God sent us that we're not going to have to endure a storm. Amen. Or if we do, that the storm won't be so violent that it can become scary. Right. We It's like we sometimes believe because God sent me that I'm not going to experience opposition. But see, the thing about it is the fact that God is with you is opposition is going to come because God wants us to know who he is that he's in the boat but sometimes there's a quiet storm sometimes the storm is not physical sometimes the storm is not outward sometimes the storm is eternal because I have to look at this story from a human perspective and so again they were afraid fear is in, internal right Fear is, is, is an emotion. It is a feeling that is internal and it, it have an external manifestation like they went to him in a panic. See, fear always brings panic and panic frustrates the process. And sometimes it's the quiet storms that take us out the most. Sometimes it's when the storm of insecurity begins to rage in our minds. When we know that we're really, we know that we are qualified or we know that we have the skills or we've been prepared. We know that, you know, we have gotten the education or the experience to do what God is calling us to do. But like Gideon, we see ourselves as small. Like Gideon, we see ourselves as weak and we don't see ourselves as God sees us. And so the storm of insecurity will begin to rage in your mind. And next thing you know, you're paralyzed and you don't move. And you don't do what God told you to do. And then you look around and you see other people and you see them being successful and you see them being fruitful and you see them doing some of the same things or something similar that God told you to do. And you're looking at them like, well, what's the difference? Or then you really begin, that storm really begins to um, rage because now you say, I knew I couldn't do it. I knew that wasn't for me. I knew I wasn't, you know, I wasn't good enough because now you're comparing yourself, but you don't realize that in the same way, they may have had insecurity. They may have had a storm of insecurity. They may have had a storm of fear, but it was like, what was their response? Because Jesus said to the disciples in the boat, he said, oh, ye of little faith. Where is your faith? And so sometimes it's the quiet storms that shipwreck us. Sometimes it's the quiet storm of the voice of insecurity, of the voice of fear. Sometimes it's other people's voices. Maybe you were told that you were not good enough. Maybe you were told by the ex that no one else is going to love you. No one's going to want you. You're not pretty enough. Nobody's going to like you. Nobody's going to accept you. And then now it's their voice playing over and over and over in your mind. And it's creating a quiet storm. Sometimes it's not fear necessarily that is the culprit in and of itself. Sometimes we are fearful to succeed. Sometimes we're afraid. What if it do work? What if I do get big? What if I am successful? What if what if people start calling me? Then it's like, am I going to be able to measure up? So now that doubt begins to come in. Now self-sabotage begins to come in. Now imposter syndrome begins to come in. And now we allow this storm to rage and rage instead of trusting not in of ourselves, but in the God who sent us. Because if God be for you, who can be against you? If God told you to go, then that means he's with you. And he's already took in consideration your weaknesses. He's already took in, your cons in consideration your areas where you, you, you may not have everything you know, that is necessary. And that's why he said, I'll be your strength and your weakness. 
But even when it's a storm, like when it's a quiet storm or when it's a physical storm, the posture that God will, wants us to get to, he wants us to get to the place where we are able to be still. That we are able not to panic because, again, frustration, panic frustrates the process. Because when you get into panic mode, I'm telling you, and I'm telling you from experience, y'all, like, I'm not going to hold you. Like, sis be sometime in panic mode, even though I know God has told me he's with me. I know God has assured me that I'm not going to fail. He's not going to forsake me. I know all of these things, but it's something about facing the storm. It's something about knowing that your situation, that you that if you don't do something about your situation, that, that the threat of, you know, what could actually happen. It's, it's, it's the thought of not having what you need to pay the bills. It's the thought of... Of, you know not being able to provide for your family it's the thought of you know things not you know you not having you know the things that you need it's the thought of you know losing again when you feel like you've already lost so much and you the idea of losing one more thing can just send you over the edge it's something about panic that cause you now. Now I begin to start doing. Now I'm trying to figure it out. Now I'm doing this and I'm doing too much. And instead of me being still, because if I'm still, maybe the Lord will download into me the answer. Maybe he would be able to download into me the instructions. Maybe he'll be able to download into me who he wants me to connect with. Right. Maybe he wants to be able to, you know, give me the thing that I am in that I'm desperately trying to discover or uncover for myself. Maybe he'll give me that thing if I be still. And see, the thing that is the hardest thing to do when you're in the midst of a storm is to be still. But see, Jesus, he was asleep. He was asleep because he knew who he was. Amen. See, it's never about who is God. It's always about who do we think he is. Oh, come on, somebody. What did he ask Peter? He said, who do you say I am? My God, we have to ask ourselves, who do we say our God is? Come on, somebody. Even if the situation is dead, even if the boat do get shipwrecked, do we not believe that we serve a God who will cause a lifeboat to all of a sudden appear that we'll end up on a life raft? Or even if we're on a piece of the boat that we still won't sink? Who do we say he is? And the problem is when we get in a storm, it's not the storm. The problem is our perspective. Come on, whether it's a quiet storm or whether it's a physical storm, the storm is not the issue. The issue is our perspective of who our God is in the storm. And do we believe that we serve the God over the storm? Do we believe we serve the God who is able to command the winds and the waves and they cease and desist, that they be still? He said, peace be still. That's all he did. And they and, and they obeyed him, right? Do we believe that's the God we serve? Or do we really have some kind of doubt internally that we don't believe God is who he say he is? That's what the Lord began to minister to me. He said, don't get caught in the storm. Because the thing about the storm is can make you, it can break you. It's two things that can happen when you get into a storm. Even when it's God that led you in it. Because sometimes God will allow us to enter into a storm. Because God is wanting to test us to see who do we really say he is. It's easy to say with our mouth. Lord, I know you're able. Lord, I know you're deliverer. Lord, I know you're way maker. I know you're the resurrection. So if you know he's the resurrection, when something died before you, why you? panic come on and again i'm not just talking to you all i'm talking to myself because sometimes we have to learn how to encourage ourselves like david it's not always we need to hear a sermon and hearing a sermon is great it's not always we need to hear a prophetic word a prophetic word is great it's not always that we need to go and seek wise counsel from other people wise counsel is great there's safety in a multitude of wise counsel but sometimes you just need to sit back and allow the lord to minister to you and you encourage yourself because it's something about what happens to you in your mind when you end the storm and if our mind is not set if we have not been renewed the bible says in romans 12 and 1 be ye not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind why is that so important it's important because the battle is always mental Come on, somebody. The battle is always mental. Yeah, there are physical manifestations of a battle, but the battle is always mental. I find that the way that the enemy likes to fight us the most is in our minds. It's in our thoughts. It's in our soul. It's our mind, our will, our emotions. It's our intellect, our appetites that the enemy likes to come in and he likes to sow seeds of, of discord or doubt or unbelief or confusion to the point that now we begin to doubt everything God 
told us. We begin to doubt the miracles again. I don't know about you, but I've seen God come through for me. I've seen God do it miraculously. But then it's something about being in a new storm. Amen. See, because again, we got to remember the disciples seeing Jesus do the miraculous. They seen it firsthand with their own eyes. And yet and still they got into that storm and their emotions, their perspective, all that they have seen, all of that they have partook in, all of they think that they have witnessed some kind of way went to the back burner or left their mind to now they allow themselves to be so overtaken with fear that they go to Jesus in fear and not faith. How many times in our situation do we go to God in fear but not faith? We go to God and we're in a panic and we're pleading, we're begging. Lord, Lord, please, don't you see my circumstances? Please, God, please, don't you see what I'm going through? Don't you see what's happening? Oh, Lord, don't you, don't you? And, and we're not coming from a place, a posture of faith like, Lord, I know that you're the great I am. I know that you have authority over the storm. I know that the enemy has already been defeated. I know that you're a provider. You can provide a ram in a bush. I know you're the resurrection and you can resurrect this situation i know the word says that all things work together for my good i expect it to work together for my good instead of us going in faith we go in fear and in the same way jesus responded to his disciples is how he responds to us today especially to those of us that are mature in christ he's like oh yeah little faith why do you doubt why do you doubt even the quiet storms the quiet storms that's raging, that's telling you, you're not who God says you are. Why is you not casting down that thought? Why are you not holding that into captivity, into the obedience of Christ Jesus? Why are you not replacing that with the word? Why are you not meditating on the word day or night? The reason why the Bible tells us to do these things is because he understands that they, they're, they're tools that we're going to need. It's not about, you know, if, it's when. When are we going to need to be able to cast down this imagination and then replace it with the truth? It's about when. But the problem, again, is not the obstacles. It's not the warfare. It's not the storms. It's our perspective. It's what do we really believe? Because it's something about being in the press, under the pressure of life, under the pressure of, of, of circumstances, under the pressure of, you know, of, of having to produce and you don't have nothing to produce, under the pressure of having to uh, make a payment that you can't make, under the pressure of a sick child, under the pressure of a dying loved one, under the pressure of a, di of a, of a, of a diagnosis, you know, that is unfavorable, under the pressure. It's something about being under the pressure that reveals what you really believe. It's the same way like Peter, when, when he told the Lord, when Peter, when the Lord told him, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. And Peter like, no, nah, no, I'm not. I love you. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to die with you. No, never. Because it's something about when we under the press that brings out what's really in us. And God doesn't reveal that to, to condemn us or to cause us to be shameful. He wants us to see the thing that he's trying to get out of us. Uh, the Lord will allow us to be crushed because he wants us to see that there's still too much fear in there. That he wants you to get rid of that fear. There's still too much doubt. There's still too much unbelief, right? There's still too much insecurity. There's still too much something that's in there that he needs to get out you so the only way he can do that is he has to allow you to be squeezed and absolutely what jesus told peter was going to happen happened the moment he saw what really went down the moment he saw when they really took jesus the moment he, uh, even after he sliced off come on somebody you gotta have you a rider okay you gotta have somebody that peter said look okay i'm slicing something off because they y'all ain't taking us without a fight but it wasn't the time and Jesus is like those that live by the sword die by the sword because he understood this was a part of his of his journey. And he re and he restored that man's ear. And once Peter was able to see now that Jesus allowed himself. And again, they didn't overtake Jesus. It may have appeared that way, but Jesus submitted. He allowed himself to be captured. He has allowed himself to be arrested and taken in captivity. But once Peter was seeing what was going on, the master that he was serving, the man he was following, the, the, the man that he known to be God in the flesh, that the Lord revealed to him who he was when, when he said, who do you say I am? And he said, for you are the Messiah. You're the son of God. And he said, it was that 
you didn't know that by human by by the flesh you knew that by the spirit the lord revealed that to you even though he had a revelation of who Jesus was, even though he saw Jesus be transformed into his true deity on the, you know, on the mountain when, uh, when he was going through his transfiguration, he was able to see Jesus in an intimate way because it was Peter, James and John who was always able to go into the deep places with Jesus. So he had a deep relationship with Jesus. And even though he knew Jesus to be God, he knew him to be power. He knew he had a revelation that he was the son of God. He walked with him. He he was taught by the, him, you know, and he was discipled by him for three years. It was still something about when he saw the one that he loved, when he saw the one that he respected and honored, the one that he trusted, the one that, you know, he was close to, the one that he just knew he was all powerful. See To see him now be restrained, to see him now being, you know, going through all of the the torment that he went through to to be to be beat and flogged to be carried away to be you know to 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 you know that to um the accused of something that he didn't do and to you know to, to endure all of the the things they were smacking him they were punching him they were spitting on him they were just doing all this crazy stuff and peter was seeing this starting to take place and all of a sudden the fear the fear because peter was now he was in a storm but peter wasn't in a physical storm he was in a quiet storm because now fear began to wrestle with against his faith. Fear began to wrestle with his what he knew, who he knew Jesus to be. And because of fear, all of a sudden, instead of him responding in faith, he started responding in fear and he began to not to deny Jesus. And it wasn't because that he didn't love Jesus. It wasn't because when he told Jesus that he would die for him and he would go to, you know, he was not leaving him, that he didn't mean it. It was because sometimes we're not aware that there is still more, more fear in us than we think. And God wants us to get to the place, A, to stop trying to resist the storm. Jesus tells them, come on, let's go over to the other side. So he tells them, he invites them. The only way they could get to the other side was a boat. So he tells them to get in this boat, right? They get in the boat with Jesus and then he go fast asleep. They stand up in the boat and all of a sudden there's a storm. So there's some storms that God will allow you to go in. Or he may even tell you to do something knowing that a storm is in the path right because the bible tells us that all things are going to work together for the good of those that love god and are called according to his purposes so there's something about a storm that will produce something in you and when we try to resist the storm i know i'm i know it ain't just me i don't like storms okay i don't like natural storms like when it's rainy and gloomy and stormy and thundering and lightning and the wind is blowing and trees are you know being blown down and electric is being you know um uh disabled and you know going out i don't like that i don't i just don't even like a gloomy rainy day to be honest i like it sun shining i like blue skies because there's something about the sun and there's something about you know just the just the brightness and the beauty of the day that just energizes you and sometimes that gloomy weather those gloomy days it just kind of just you know kind of takes your energy a little bit so i don't even like a physical storm i for sure don't like a, a storm that i gotta enter into in life okay and sometimes we get into a storm that god led us into and the first thing we do is we're trying to resist it we're trying to resist the storm because for some reason we think that this storm has the ability to take us out like the disciples for some reason they thought that they were going to perish even though jesus was in the boat with them they thought they would perish for some reason we don't think we're going to make it out so when we get into the storm instead of us you know submitting and saying lord you let me into the storm or you allow this storm. Lord God, what is it you want me to learn? What is it you want me to do? What are you trying to reveal to me, Lord God? Give me the wisdom and how to endure the storm. Give me the wisdom and how to make it out, un, you know, un, unharmed, right? Instead of us going to God, but those, that, that, that takes a lot of maturity though. And so I'm not there yet, you know, to God be the glory. I pray I'm there soon. But my, my normal response when I'm in a storm is I'm like trying to do everything I can to resist it. Because a part of it's something in me that don't want to be in a storm. I don't want my life, you know, being chaotic. I don't want things, you know, turning upside down. I don't want to be going through hard situations and hard things. I don't want to lose things. I don't want to deal, you know, you know, be in places, you know, that 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 cause me to have to, you know, be, you know, like 
where I have no control or, you know, where I'm just, you know, not even able to do what I need to do with my, for my family or, you know, whatever the case may be. I don't like that. I don't want to be in that kind of situation. So I try to resist it. And, the, and what you will find is the more you resist the storm, the longer you're in the storm. Right? The more you try to resist the storm, the longer you're in the storm. So we got to learn, and, and all storms God don't lead us into or allow us to enter into, I shall say. Some storms are a result of the enemy, right? Some storm are, storms are a result of ourselves. We just make bad decisions sometimes. We just exercise our free will sometimes, and we do what we want to do. And sometimes the result of that is a storm. And then they say, you know, we still trying to resist it, even though we know we got ourselves in there. But it's like God is still going to use it. God is not going to allow you to be in a storm of any kind, and He not and He not bring you out. But for some reason, it's something about the nature of the storm that creates all of these false narratives in our mind, and then we start leaning more in, more into fear than faith. So it's not about resisting the storm; it's about Lord. Let me see who you are in the storm. Come on, somebody. Who are you trying to reveal? What part of your nature are you trying to reveal to me in this storm? Who do you need me to see you as? Because see, God has natures. He has natures and he has, so there's sides of God. We don't, he don't reveal all. We're never going to know his, the fullness of who he is, especially not until we enter into heaven. But there are parts of God like that he slowly is trying to, you know, reveal unto us. So yes, you may know him as Jehovah Rapha. Now he might need you, you to see him as Jehovah Nisi. He might need you to see him as a banner of victory. So he might let you get into a battle. So how do you know him to be victorious or to be your banner of victory if you're never in a battle? So it's not always about the storm doing something to you. Sometimes it's about the storm revealing who is God trying to show you that he is today. Because we can't live off old faith. We can't live off old miracles or old, you know, blessings. We be needing a, 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 a fresh word. We need, we need a right now word. His mercies are new every morning. So sometimes the storm is there because he wants you to see him as Jehovah Jireh. He wants you to see you. See, he might allow you to get into a situation where you feel like that you've been treated unjustly because he needs you to know him as the just judge. And see, because we don't understand that God is always, you know, it, he's always trying to, you know, build us up. He's always trying to reveal more of himself and bring us in closer to him. He's always trying to, you know, call us, you know, to come in more. You know, he don't want us to be in that outer court. It's time to come into the inner court. So now it's time for you to see him as the resurrection. It's time for you to see him, you know, as your, your sanctification. It's time for him you to see him, you know, as well, X, Y, and Z. So he'll allow a storm. And so B, in the storm, we have to remember who our God is. When we enter into a storm, it's, that, it's time for us to really sit down with ourselves and really just get anchored in who our God is. So our perspective is, is not shifted because of the nature of the or, or the violence of the storm. Because some stories are just violent. Sometimes life happens and it knocks the very wind out of you. Come on, somebody. I've been there. Sometimes life comes in such a way that you don't, you really feel like you're not going to make it. But it's still in those moments that we have to keep our mind on Jesus. The Bible says when we keep our minds on Jesus, that he'll keep us in perfect peace. The reason why we don't have no peace in the storm is because our mind is too much on the storm and not on Jesus. You need to have a mindset shift. Until you get the mindset shift, you're going to be in a place of panic. You're going to be in a place of fear. You're going to keep trying to, you know, just fig try to figure it out for yourself or try to do all of these things to get yourself out. And you're going to be just spinning your wheels because God is trying to renew your mind. The Lord is trying to show you who he is. The Lord is trying to get you to recognize that he's the God over the storm. It don't matter what your storm is. There is nothing God cannot do. There is nothing too hard for him. All things are possible with God. But we do, it's like, do we believe that? 
And again, I'm speaking to myself because I have entered into storms and all of a sudden, all of these great things that I know God has done for me personally, all of the miracles that I've seen with my own eyes, all of the ways I've known God to show up, all of the things that I've, you know, just poured into my spirit in the word, just, 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 just meditate on the word. All of that goes out the window simply because I enter opposition. All of a sudden, my perspective of who God is shifts. All of a sudden, I forget that Jesus said that in this life, we will experience trial and tribulation. We will have storms. Why do we think it's odd? Or why do we think it's strange that we enter into temptation or we enter into a trial or a storm when Jesus already told us that we will? And yet and still, the very fact that when we get into the storm, that we are in a place of fear. That's why he say, oh, you have little faith. So then that lets us know our faith is low. Mm, come on, somebody. Some of the things we're asking God for and we're believing for takes great faith. Because it's now faith. Is the things is the evidence of things hoped for. Is and and now faith is the substance, excuse me, of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Now faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. And let it be unto you according to thine faith, right? Faith without works is dead. So there are some things that we're asking and praying God to God for and that we're desiring that is gonna take faith. But maybe we our faith isn't big enough yet. And so God allows us to enter in, enter into a trial. He allows us to enter into a testing. He allows us to enter into a storm because he wants to build our faith. Because there's some mountains that don't move unless you have the faith to speak to them. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. There are some healings that don't come unless you believe that you're healed. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. There are some circumstances that's not going to change until you believe that they are changed. See, it's a thing about belief and faith that is so powerful that simply if we believe, the Bible says all things are possible for those who believe. And the thing is, we say we believe, but we really don't. Because if we really believe that God is who he say he is and that God can do what he say he can do, we can enter into a storm. We can enter into a trial. We can enter into a test and we can be asleep on the boat like Jesus. And I know it's easier said than done because I haven't mastered it yet. But it's something about this message and it's something about the way the Lord ministered to me. And when he said, don't get caught in the storm. And I said, Lord, why would you say that? And it's because, see, the, when you get so focused on the storm, you will get caught in it. Because now you can't see what God is really doing. You can't see how he's really prospering you. You can't see of how he's really building you. You can't see of how he's really shaping and molding you. How he's really maturing you. You're not able to see the things that he's doing. Because you're too worried about what the devil's doing. You're worried about what the people doing. What the witches and the warlocks is doing. You're worrying about what the storm is doing. And it's like, yes, these things are real. We're not even going to demean them or pretend that they don't exist. But they're not greater than your God. Because he who is greater, he who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. See, the devil, he's a created being. He's the God of this world. But we serve the God, the creator of the heavens and the earth and the entire universe and all things that are created. So again, he doesn't have all the power. But see, it's something about being in a storm and being in a hard place and being in a fire and being in a trial that somehow makes us think that this thing is so much bigger than what it really is and that the enemy has more power than what he really does. And then again, we begin to doubt who our God is. If the Bible tells us that all things work together for the good, that means storms are included. If the Bible tells us that all things work together for our good, that means trials are included. Right? That means testing is included. And see, again, I want to go back to the quiet storm because I want to say this. Sometimes the quiet storm is condemnation. Sometimes we think we messed up too bad. Like we might come to the realization that, oh, wow, I got it wrong. I was supposed to go left, but I went right. I was supposed, I don't know, somewhere I got confused and God told me to do this and I did that. Maybe the Lord gave me the opportunity and I squandered it. And God wants to free you today. 
He said, there's no condemnation. Maybe somebody needs to go read that in Romans. Maybe you need to meditate on that every day. There is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Listen, God understands we're not perfect. He understands that we are in the flesh. He understands that sometimes we have many variables coming at us. That it's, it's sometimes that it's not it's not our heart's posture to get it wrong. Sometimes we make a, more, a decision because sometimes it's an influence. Sometimes, you know, we, we hear a different voice. Sometimes it's people. We go to people and we seek advice and they give us wrong advice. Sometimes it's fear because we really afraid. So we make a decision that's more comfortable because we want to stay in that place where, where we're comfortable. Sometimes, you know, we really think that we're following God and making the right decision. And we find out later on that it wasn't. God say, repent. The righteous man falls seven times, but he gets back up. Repent and move on. Repent. There is no condemnation. It's like, who do you believe your God is? When he says that if you come to him and you repent, you seek forgiveness, you're sincere in your heart, that he's just to forgive you, that it's, as far as the east is from the west, that it's in the small of his back, he don't remember it no more. Why are you remembering it? Why are you allowing it to torment you? And make you all of a sudden, now you're disqualifying yourself. Now you really is in a place of uh, uh, of of doubt. Because now you don't think God going to do it for you. You don't think God going to bless you. You don't think God going to answer your prayer. Because some way you, 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 you got it wrong. You missed the mark. You sinned. That's what sin means. You missed the mark. But the Bible tells us we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We don't practice sin. But sometimes we just... We, we fall into sin. And that's why his grace is sufficient. And that is why he is just to forgive. Because he understands it's not always on purpose. And he wants to free someone today. And he wants to say, stop harping on the past. Stop harping on the past. Stop harping on the decisions that you see now that in hindsight that you know that you made that were wrong. Stop, stop reliving it. Stop rehashing it out in your mind. Stop talking about it. Come on, somebody, because you're because you're 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 gonna be you're gonna get stuck in the storm. You're gonna get stuck because you're gonna be stuck in the past. You're stuck about the oh, I wish I would have did this instead of that. Oh, I should have did this. Dang, I wish I if I could go back. Okay, but you can't. Learn from it and move past it. Some of us are not where we're supposed to be. Not because of a storm. Not because uh, the Lord is, uh, is, is not doing it yet. Not because of the enemy. Simply because we won't move past it. Some, somebody needs to forgive. Somebody been holding on to a grudge. You're holding on to a all. You're holding on to offense from 10, 15, 20 years ago. You know you just need to let it go. You keep talking about it every time you go to the family outing. Every time you get on the phone with your you loved ones or your or your friends, all you do is talk about what that person did to you, how that man dogged you out, how that person betrayed you. All you do is talk about it, but you say you over it, but you constantly just rehashing it and retalking about it, and you're over. It. And all you do is you know just won't let it go. Let it go. Forgive. Release it. Some of us are, are, are holding ourselves up because we just won't let go of things. Let go of the past. Let go of the mistake. Let go of the offense. Let go of the art. Oh, yes, I understand it's not easy. But guess what? If you want to move past the storm, come on, somebody. If you want to move and enter into the place of promise, if you want to enter into the next level of your life, if you want to see the blessings of God that make it rich and add no sorrow, then you're going to have to do these things. It is no way around them. See, that's the thing about God. There is no cutting corners with God, right? Like, he, it's just a long, narrow road. And you just got to stay the course. There's no cutting corners. There's no getting rich quick schemes over here. Okay? Not in the kingdom of heaven. In the kingdom of darkness, all the schemes and scams. You can get rich quick. But when you do it God's way, it's slow and steady. But slow and steady wins the race. And see, God has a way of accelerating us. And so he has a way of getting us where we was always supposed to be. But you have to be willing to repent. You have to be willing um, to not resist the storm. You have to be willing to let go of the past. You have to be willing to forgive anybody you need to forgive. You have to be willing to have a change your mind. Be transformed by the renew, renew your mind. So then now you're able to, to endure and move past it. You're able to withstand the storm. And eventually, guess what? The storm ceases. 
Storms don't last always. Trouble don't last. Do it feel like it? Absolutely. I'm a living witness. I can testify. Sometimes it feel like trouble is lasting too long. But it's tr it don't last always. If you learn what you need to learn, if you do what you need to do, you will see that thing begin to evaporate. You will see those clouds begin to dissipate. And you will see the sun start coming through. Come on, somebody. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the Son of God. You will see him. You will see the sun begin to shine on you again. But you just have to be willing to do to do what you, to, to, to stay in the boat. Don't resist it. Stay in the boat. Learn who your God is in the storm. Come on, somebody. And so, I don't know. Um, I hope this made some sense to you guys. I know this is, it, again, it's, it's for me. It's for me. It really is. Because, like I said, I'm just going to be honest with you guys. Sis be, like, tripping. I'm just going to be honest. Like, I listen, I be in the storm. I be in the valley. I be in the trial. And let me tell you, I, I be panicking. I do. And I lose sight of who my God is. And I always am trying to panic and, and cause me to try to do something. When God say be still. And that's the last thing I'm going to say. Mm, my God. <sighs> the last thing I'm going to say is sometimes the antidote to the storm is just being still. Do it sound crazy? Yes. Is it illogical? Yes. Is it gonna is it does it go against everything your 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 flesh and, and logic and reason is 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 gonna say to you? Yeah. But that's not normally where God likes to flow, right? He likes to flow in that realm. And so sometimes the word of the Lord, while we're in the storm, he's saying, be still. Yeah, he know the people threatening to come get your stuff. They threatening to kick you out. They threatening to evict you. They threatening to come get your car. They threatening, you know, to fire you. They threatening, you know, to do X, Y, and Z, right? Yes, right? He know that things is falling apart. He know that you don't, that you got to have, you know, whatever the, the finances to meet the need. He knows you need to provide for your family. He knows, you know, you need, you know, uh, you him to show up in your circumstances. He know you need justice. He know, you know, you need, you, you, he know. And he's still saying, be still and know that I am God. Sometimes the greatest form of worship and the greatest testament of faith is simply being still in the midst of the storm. That tells God that we totally trust him. Like Abraham, when he was about to go sacrifice his son, he had, could you not imagine the, the quiet storm that was raging inside of him? But he trusted God. And he knew no matter what happened, some way, somehow, God was going to have to work this thing for his good because he had a promise that it was through him and his descendants and his promised son that all of the world would be blessed. And so he was able to stand on that promise, knowing that God, who he who has promised, is faithful to perform it. That even if you think you lose it, God will give it back or give you something better. And so that's the how I just want to leave the podcast on that note. Be still and know. Sometimes everything that God told you to do, you've done it. And you feel like it's something more. God is saying, be still and know that I am God. So, I hope you guys was blessed from today's podcast. I thank you guys so much for listening. As always, I pray that the Lord bless you and keep you. I pray that the Lord will make his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you, and grant you his peace. And just know that your past does not define you. It develops you. And you are worthy.